This lecture is going to be about a slightly different perspective than what we've been taking so far in this series. I'm going to shift from the philosophy of science to the sociology of science. Now, uh, this is in no small part, though, still because of the impact of Thomas Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions on uh, the thinking about the nature of science. It wasn't just philosophy and history that were reacting to Kuhn uh, and that Kuhn was building on. There's a lot of sociologists who, who looked at Kuhn's work and basically said, well, this just shows that that philosophy of science is dead. They thought that Kuhn killed the philosophy of science, and they wanted to sort of present their own discipline as a way of where intellectuals thinking about the nature of science should go next. They proposed sociology of science, if you will, as a successor discipline to the philosophy of science. Now, uh, suffice to say, there was a lot of controversial claims made. That's how academics work. Many of them have since sort of been uh, thrown aside, debunked both by philosophers of science and fellow uh, sociologists of science. Um, other ones have stuck, stuck, stood around and held up to the, the test of time, as it were. Um, there has been, uh, I think, I think it's fair to say, a bit of a, a, a waning in the interest in the sociology of science amongst sociologists. Philosophy of science is still very much sort of in vogue amongst philosophers. Uh, and while certainly there are still sociologists working on the sociology of science, it's nowhere near as hot as it was in, uh, say, the 1970s and 80s, uh, when a, a lot of their most exciting work was being done. Now, um, I am going to be covering some of this material in part because, again, I am thinking of this course sort of as a covering more or less basically the 20th century uh, thinking on the nature of science, principally about the philosophy of science. Um, uh, and so I, I think it makes sense to talk about and, and, uh, the sociology of science since it did have an impact um, and some some good ideas did come out of it. So even, even if it turns out that a lot of uh, the ideas the sociologists have uh, are ones that I don't accept or that even that you don't accept, uh, it's still worth studying this material because like Paul Paul Feyerabend was suggesting in the previous lecture, even wrong ideas can be useful. Even though, so even if we don't think that the sociologist, sociological approach necessarily gets everything right, or even a lot right, um, uh, there's, there's still some insights that can be gained from paying attention to some of the things that these people said. Now, th that having been said, obviously I think a disclaimer needs to be presented here. Um, this material is kind of hard for me to cover for what should be fairly obvious reasons, that I don't have a sociological background. I have no training in sociology. I am trained as a philosopher. Um, my, my principal study in this area is in the philosophy of science, not in the sociology of science. Uh, I have read the so a lot of the sociolo sociologist material. I have spoken to a colleague of mine who teaches sociology of science about this stuff. I've done my best to wrap my head around it, uh, but at the same time I think I have to admit that if this lecture were being given by a sociologist, it would probably be significantly different in important ways, not the least of which it probably would be a lot more flattering to the discipline of sociology. Um, I'm, as you see, I'm going to be fairly critical of a lot of this material. Um, now, Again, I'm not trying to go out of my way to be uh, to sort of be territorial here. I'm not suggesting that sociologists are wrong because sociology is somehow an, an inferior discipline to philosophy. Quite the opposite, actually. I actually kind of think that sociology, it, while it does certainly have its own distinctive methods and uh, its own distinctive questions and, and, and so forth, fundamentally at base level, I sort of believe that sociology really is kind of just a, a particular application of philosophy. Uh, uh, it, it, there, the, the, there's a lot of overlap between the kinds of questions that sociologists ask and the kinds of questions that philosophers ask. There's a reason why I have several friends in the sociology department at my uh, uh, university, and we get along well, and we can talk academics, uh, because there's, you know, maybe not the, the same language, but uh, definitely very, very similar languages going on between them. Now, of course, if you ask any of them, uh, they would probably say that the best reason why, uh, the reason, explanation for the reason why I think this way is because of the sort of sociological factors that have influenced me, most notably my, my education and so forth, my intellectual upbringing. Um, um, so uh, both disciplines have been known to try to get behind one another. Sociology tries to explain philosophy, and philosophy tries to explain sociology. It's not my point in this lecture here to try to sort of hash that out or to engage in that kind of territorial pissing. That's not my intention at all. Um, but I do have to admit that I cannot get out from behind my own perspective. I cannot see the, this, this terrain in a completely impartial way. I am a philosopher, and I'm going to own that. I'm not, I'm not going to apologize for it or, or say I'm ashamed of it, but it is indeed the, uh, something that you should keep in mind as you listen to this. I am going to do my best to present this material as fairly as possible, um, but bear in mind that, that I have my own sort of perspective on this too, uh, and that's something you should take into account.
Okay, now that's out of the way. Let's, let me say a little bit about what sociology as a discipline is, because I'm suspecting that some of you might not be, be terribly familiar with sociology in the broad sense of, uh, of the term. Now, sociology is the study of human social structures and social activity. Um, uh, it, it, it does consider itself to be a science and to use empirical tools and methods to study things like, for example, religion, mass media, art, class structures, education, business law, crime, and of course, for my purposes here today, science. Um, and there's a whole host of other sort of social structures that they try to analyze and understand uh, uh, using these these tools and other tools like it. Um, now, again, it, it's, uh, it, it's I think it's fair to compare it in many ways to something like economics. Economics and uh, sociology are both social sciences. Um, now, again, there have been several people in the history of thought who have questioned whether or not the social sciences actually should be considered genuine sciences. This, these, are, these are people who tend to have something that's what referred to as a physics bias. They say, they say physics is what a real science should look like and social sciences don't look like that. Um, this is not a perspective that I share, but it is at least one, one that's worth mentioning. Um, it's also worth noting that there is something that uh, is, is called, you might call a reflexivity problem. Uh, uh, they're going to try to use science to study science, to be a science of science. And there's you get sort of like a potential feedback mechanism. There are a whole of mirrors effect, which can sometimes get disorienting. And this is something I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail uh, uh, later on. Now, as a general rule, sociology of science is trying to get behind science. And use that, that phrase again. You know, they're, 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 there's sort of this presumption that if you can use sociological tools to explain why physicists believe what physicists believe, then ultimately sociology is the superior discipline. Again, that's kind of perhaps a sort of a, a, a petty way of phrasing it or a territorial way of phrasing it. Um, uh, but it is worth noting that again, uh, there, I, I have been playing with, a, with something like sort of a, a physics first perspective for an awful lot of this lecture series, using a lot of examples from physics, uh, using stories about Albert Einstein as sort of my go-to examples. Uh, so I think it only makes sense to say that maybe, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not unfair for sociologists to say, hey, wait a minute, we've kind of been ignored in this conversation, and that's really not fair. Maybe we should see what the, what the world of science looks like from a sociology first point of view rather than from a physics first point of view. Now, the first specific sociologist I want to talk about uh, is a guy actually who predates Thomas Kuhn, uh, who's one of the more important sociologists of the 20th century, a guy by the name of Robert Merton, uh, who uh, I think was, it's fair to say, is probably the first thinker to really sort of apply modern sociological tools to studying science as well as its historical development. Uh, and like I say, Merton actually did predate Kuhn in some ways, so the fact that he sort of uh, was looking at the history of science before Kuhn does show he's a little bit ahead of the curve there. Um, outside of the context of sociology of science, Merton coins several phrases that most everyday people are familiar with, including the phrases self-fulfilling prophecy, role model, and unintended consequences. And, and these things are sort of part of our everyday vocabulary nowadays. So, so it really goes to show, you know, even if you haven't studied sociology, um, uh, Merton's influence has sort of been felt in a lot of the ways that we think about and frame our, our social lives. Uh, his work on the sociology of science principally came out of the 1940s, uh, and, and he did uh, stuff which is, uh, uh, unlike some of the stuff I'm going to talk about later, I think fairly uncontroversial in a lot of ways. Uh, he was trying to understand what sort of norms govern scientific communities. What are the things, the values that hold scientific communities together? What are the things that they are most interested in? And on Merton's analysis, he saw there were four central norms to social commu scientific communities. First off, communalism, not communism. Remember, this is the 1940s. Uh, it's important to remember what was going on in the United States at that time, uh, and, and for that matter, the Western world uh, and, and Europe. Um, uh, but so it's not communism, but it's, it's something somewhat related to communalism. That's the first value. Uh, then there's universalism, disinterestedness, and organized skepticism. I'm going to unpack all these in just a second. But one of the things I love about Merton's analysis here is these four norms c come together to get the acronym KUDOS, which, like I say, I just, I love that acronym, KUDOS. It's something that's, it, it just feels kind of vaguely sort of positivistic. I mean, my, 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 vaguely positive, not positivistic, excuse me. Um, and it just sort of get, puts a smile on my face. Okay, so let, let, let's unpack this idea of KUDOS. Now, starting with communalism. According to communalism, scientific ideas belong to everybody. They're, they're not the property of any person. So while Charles Darwin gets his name associated with 
uh, the theory of evolution. Uh, Darwin didn't patent the theory of evolution, nor could some future scientist who discovers something like evolution patent that. Um, uh, this, the, the ideas are, uh, are communal property. No one can say that they, they, it belongs to them. Darwin gets the credit, but there's a difference between giving him credit for the ideas and saying that he owns the ideas. What the individual scientists get is recognition and esteem for uh, developing ideas. They don't get to claim that they own the ideas. The, the, the ideas belong to the scientific community at large. There's some interesting applications to this way of thinking uh, nowadays if you think about the notion of paywalls. If you, if you are a, uh, a scientist or an academic to want, trying to get access to an article, oftentimes you have to pay exorbitant fees to try to get access to those articles. And there's a lot of uh, controversy now surrounding uh, whether or not this is actually morally defensible uh, given the, 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 the communal nature of science. Why is it that these publishing houses basically get to, to exercise such incredible control, profit-making control over these articles when these articles and the ideas within them ideally should belong to everybody not just the scientific community but sort of the, the, the community at large um, so uh, next up is universalism. Universalism is the idea that the sort of the particular biographical background of a scientist shouldn't really matter. Again, it doesn't really matter what the race or the ethnicity of a scientist is. It doesn't matter what their gender is or their political affiliation. None of these ideas are relevant to their scientific contributions. Um, now, in the same way that again, there's, there, there appears to be some violation of communalism with paywalls, there's a lot of uh, a violation of universalism in the history of science. Uh, one example, which I've talked about before, uh, is, was that uh, Albert Einstein's ideas were challenged, were basically rejected by a lot of French and English scientists due to, the, to his being German. It was actually really hard um, uh, for Sir Arthur Eddington to go and test Einstein's ideas on the general theory of relativity, precisely because Eddington was British, uh, Einstein was German, and there was a, a war going on at the time between the two, and so there was a lot of animosity. Uh, so, uh, so even though both of these norms can be violated, and uh, all pretty much all norms can be violated in some sense or another, uh, that doesn't stop them from being norms. Science at its best, according to Merton, a holds to these values. It doesn't mean it always lives up to these values. Next up is disinterestedness. Scientists should want to be rewarded not in sort of some sort of financial gain or some sort of personal gain, but rather simply because they are contributing to science. Um, uh, uh, if, if you go into science to make money, and in fairness, you can make a fair bit of money in science if you go into the right branches of science, uh, you're probably getting into it for the wrong reasons. Uh, the reasons to get, to get into science are fundamentally about uh, contributing something, helping understand the world better, helping people see the world in which they live better. Personal Personal gain is sort of considered uh, uh, not not completely unacceptable, but a, a lesser motive. Um, you want to make money, go into business. If you want to contribute to the world of knowledge and understanding, that's when you go into science. Lastly, organized skepticism. Organized skepticism says that fundamentally all ideas are open to scrutiny and to be tested. No one's findings should, gets taken to be unquestionable. No matter how brilliant they are, no matter what institution they work for, everyone should come together and say, thank you for your contribution. Now we're going to see if we can pick it apart. Um, uh, the, uh, the authority of science should rest in precisely the fact that it can withstand scrutiny, not within the fact that, that, that people have you know uh, lots of degrees or they work for some... Uh, well-established uh, institution or something like that. Um, and this, of course, skepticism needs to be structured in a very particular kind of way. You know, it involves things like, you know, a, a, a peer review, um, a, a replication, and so forth. Um, so it's, it's not just sort of an open free-for-all of people shouting each other down. Uh, it, it's, it's organized in a very, very particular way, hence the organized part of organized skepticism. Another contribution that Merton presented in the philosophy of science uh, was something he referred to as reward systems. Uh, uh, th this is tied into the, the, the point about disinterestedness. Um, uh, Merton says that fundamentally the, the, the basic currency in science, what matters most in science, is not money but recognition. What a scientist should really want is for other scientists to use their ideas, to build on them, to expand them, to apply them, to, to, to replicate them. Uh, the best compliment that one scientist can pay to another uh, is simply to, to cite them, to simply say, hey, here's a great idea from a fellow scientist, I'm going to build on it. That is what it sort of should make a scientist stay, not simply getting paid. 
Um, bragging rights is a pretty powerful motive for a lot of scientists. Be, to be the first person to, to, to pioneer a new idea, the, 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 a person whose name sort of goes down in the scientific history books uh, for recognizing something, for approving something or disproving something. Um, all that kind of stuff is, is, a, is what the ultimate incentives should be. If you are familiar with the show Futurama, I have here up here in the right-hand corner of the picture of uh, um, Far, uh, Professor Farnsworth uh, uh, and his rival, whose name is escaping me at the moment. Uh, but the, the, there's a recurring joke where the two of them are constantly trying to one-up each other uh, re with regard to their scientific achievements. Um, Wernstrom, that's the guy's name, Wernstrom, yes. So it's Farnsworth, Farnsworth, Farnsworth and Wernstrom are the, 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 the uh, scientists in that cartoon. Uh, now, uh, sort of to demonstrate this point, Merton points to several major priority disputes in the history of science. So, short list here: uh, Newton versus uh, uh, Robert Hooke when it came to the discovery of gravity, or Newton versus uh, Leibniz over the development of calculus, or uh, Darwin versus Wallace over evolution. Now, n some of these were sort of bitter and a acrimonious disputes; others were were, were cordial and respectful. Uh, but uh, the, uh, in all of them, there was this, this very, very clear, difficult question the scientific community wrestled with: over how do we determine who gets the credit for this. Again, it's not just about money. It's not just about uh, 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 that kind of sort of typical monetary capitalistic rewards, as it were. This is, this is, if you will, a credit economy in the sense of who gets the credit, uh, uh, who, who gets the recognition, who gets the fame, as it were. Um, now, uh, one of the obvious advantages of a reward system like this is it can inspire, a lot, inspire lots of hard work, creative thinking, and good science. There's a reason why the Nobel Prize is considered sort of to be the end-all, be-all of a scientific career. You get a Nobel Prize in science, and damn, it's all downhill from there, unless you can, like Marie Curie, win a second one. Now, so that, that the, 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 the structure of this reward system does good things, but it's also important to recognize it can do bad things. It inspires social deviance. Sociologists are very, very interested in this concept of deviance. Um, you know, uh, when, when someone follows the norms, they're not deviating, but when they violate the norms, they're engaging, engaging in deviant behavior. And in the context of science, deviant behavior means things like scientific fraud or plagiarizing someone else's work or, or scientific defamation, you know, trying to sort of you know, to say that someone who disagrees with you is, is a bad scientist for very reasons and just smirching their name um, amongst their colleagues. And th th this kind of behavior is considered to be uh, bad science or, uh, or, or you know, bad behavior of a scientist that needs to sort of be uh, eschewed. Now, like I said, Merton's work was not terribly controversial. Uh, it, it's 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 reasonably was respected at the time, and I think it's it's fairly easy to say that uh, that that uh, for many people, including uh, many sociologists, many philosophers, many scientists, recognize that what he says there seems like a fairly accurate description of what goes on uh, in science. Uh, one exception of this, though, uh, uh, is a group of uh, sociologists who who were reacting both to Merton's thinking and also to Thomas Kuhn's thinking after structure scientific revolutions. Um, if you want to call it think this way, you can say that Merton is the old school in the sociology of science, and and the as often happens after a few decades go by, it starts to be viewed as sort of quaint and outdated. Um, uh, you know, Merton again was interested in these sort of broad social uh, structures uh, uh, regarding science, but he wasn't paying particular attention to particular scientific fields or particular scientific theories or particular scientific beliefs, uh, and this sort of uh, uh, led a lot of other sociologists to say we need so we need a sort of a to, to look at this a little bit more closely rather than this sort of big macro picture that Merton's looking at. And as a result of that kind of uh, uh, thinking, a, a quote-unquote new school started to arise to focus much more specifically on concrete details about particular scientists. Why do scientists behave the way they behave? Why do they talk the way they talk, think the way they think? Why do they believe the kinds of things that they do? Uh, and the sociologist wanted to not just take the common sense answers for these things, and he didn't want to just take scientists' words for it. He didn't just want to ask them, why do you talk this way? Why do you think this way? That's that's not a very scientific way of, of studying this question. Uh, so th they wanted to sort of take uh, the, the, the sociological tools to get uh, the, the deeper explanation for why it is that, that uh, scientists behave in this way. Now, if you were to press Merton on these questions, I think he probably would basically would have just accepted the view of the logical positivists, something along the lines of, well, again, I, I would call this the common sense answer, right? Well, they believe what they believe because of uh, the evidence or because the, 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 they believe this theory because the theory is true or something like that. Uh, remember, 1940s, positivists were pretty, were pretty in vogue back then. But by the time you get up to about the 1960s, not so much. Um, Thomas Kuhn comes along and the whole notion of the incommensurability of paradigms and the uh, holism about testing 
interesting and holism about meaning and the death of logical positivism. You put that together uh, and the new school needs to come up with a, a different way of thinking about the sociology of science. And this is where stuff starts to get, frankly, fairly controversial, at least for, for philosophers of science.